Parade. A pictorial review of events in business and industry produced each week by the National Association of Manufacturers. America's communication system puts out to sea. Streaming out of a cable-laying ship under the ocean floor goes the most remarkable underwater cable yet perfected, a product of painstaking and exhaustive research that brings Havana, Cuba as close to us as the nearest telephone. Transmitting conversations along the bottom of the Gulf Stream is a much more complex job than transmitting them overland. Let's take a closer look at the specially constructed cable that performs that job. Around the small copper wire goes a layer of tough plastic insulation. Over that, a flexible tube of thin copper ribbons to complete the electrical circuit. Then a layer of jute, armored with a wrapping of heavy steel wires and still another protective layer of jute. But what about the amplifiers to keep the voice from fading out as it travels along under the sea? That was the challenge faced by the scientists of the Bell Telephone Laboratories. At sea, there are no convenient islands every 40 miles where amplifying stations can be built. So the Bell Laboratories engineers set out to design a new type of amplifier that could be built right into the cable. The vacuum tube is the heart of any amplifier. In your radio, tubes last a year or so. Standard telephone tubes last somewhat longer, but not long enough for use underwater, where replacement would mean pulling the cable up from the bottom. Years of research and testing produced this tube with an almost unheard of working life, an estimated 20 years. The finished amplifier, without its protective sheathing, looks like a string of sausages, but no sausage ever got the careful treatment this precious mechanism receives. The amplifying unit bends almost as freely as the cable itself. Each unit of the amplifier must be sealed hermetically to protect it from the sea. At last, the completed cable and amplifiers are loaded into the tanks of the Western Union cable ship, Lord Kelvin. Great care must be taken to prevent sharp bends or kinks that would cause internal breaks. More than one and a half million feet of cable will be carefully stowed in such a way that it will feed out smoothly and quickly when the ship is at sea. The amplifiers get special attention. Finally, the Lord Kelvin heads for Havana to start laying the cable from Cuba to Key West. Underground cable has been run from the telephone building to the water's edge, and the Lord Kelvin lies just offshore, waiting to make a connection before proceeding northward. From shore, a rope is rowed out to the ship and attached to a section of the cable. Then, with oil drums floating the cable, it is slowly pulled ashore by a winch. The job of releasing the suspended cable from the oil drums is just plain hard work, especially when the weight of the cable pulls the last few drums underwater and the workmen have to dive for them. Soon the Lord Kelvin is underway, with the cable paying out across her decks over the shiv in her prow and down to the ocean floor. It's a real job of seamanship, guiding the Lord Kelvin along a precise course past a series of marker buoys that show the way. About 40 miles out of Havana, it comes time to pay out the first amplifier. The ship is slowed down, for this is ticklish business, and easy does it. Without a hitch, the amplifier moves over the bow shiv and is left astern. Thus is laid the cable that carries 24 conversations simultaneously, the conversations of business, commerce, and friendship between the peoples of the free world. Now, more than in any period of American history, we must develop the highest degree of national unity between industry, labor, and government. This must be done because we're battling for the highest stakes free men and women can fight for, our freedom.
and our good way of life in this country. During World War II, we demonstrated that we were the arsenal of freedom. By sticking together, we can continue to outproduce and outbuild the world during this crisis. And we shall remain the arsenal of freedom and the inspiration for free men the world over. Freeport, Texas, where the Dow Chemical Company conducts what amounts to mining operations in the Gulf of Mexico, extracting from the water of the sea that valuable metal, magnesium. Here the seawater pours in to be filtered for the removal of marine life. Huge pumps bring in 400 million gallons a day. Also from the sea comes the second raw material for the manufacture of magnesium, Tons of oyster shells dredged up from the bottom and brought to the plant in barges. First the shells go to great drums in which they are washed free of sand and other unwanted materials. And then into long rotating kilns that get hotter and hotter as the shells tumble forward. By the time they reach the end, the shells are white hot. The glowing chips drop out on conveyor belts that carry them to the slaker. Here they are mixed with seawater to form magnesium hydroxide. Concentrated magnesium hydroxide is gathered to the center by rotating blades, then pumped off to another vat. Does it look like milk of magnesia? That's just what it is, but not for long, for the next chemical change takes place in the neutralizer, a huge rubber-lined steel tank in which the milk of magnesia is mixed with other ingredients to become magnesium chloride. All these steps were worked out only after extensive industrial research that led to the construction of this first seawater plant in 1940. Now to get the weak solution into a solid state, the liquid is evaporated in a brick-lined furnace where a tremendous blowtorch shoots a high-pressure flame through the mixture. The dry magnesium chloride is raked into a chute and is carried along to electric cells where tremendous charges of electricity break it down into its two component parts, chlorine and magnesium. The chlorine comes off as a gas, the magnesium as a liquid which we see here. Magnesium, the mermaid metal from the sea. The lightest structural metal we have, magnesium has many other qualities that adapt it for a wide variety of uses. Great tensile strength, resistance to corrosion and hardness are just some of the reasons magnesium can be used in the fabrication of just about anything you can mention. No wonder Uncle Sam relied so heavily on magnesium during World War II for planes, weapons, vehicles. And no wonder he's relying on it just as heavily once again as we arm for defense of the Western world. Largest user of magnesium is the aircraft industry. America's natural resources are great, but industrial know-how is our real strength. For metal in these plains came from oceans that wash nearly every nation's shores. Beyond the city limits, where a good many attractive homes are being built these days, lovers of suburban life have encountered some special problems. Gas for cooking, for example. To enjoy semi-rural privacy, they're out beyond the gas mains, and no one wants to give up the joys of cooking like this. But because of a new industry that has sprung up in the past 20 years, no one has to forego the pleasure of ultra-modern home baking no matter where he lives. The answer is liquefied petroleum gas, known now to everyone as bottle gas. Twenty years ago, there was no bottle gas industry. Propane gas, as it's technically known, was nothing but an irritation to the petroleum industry, for propane is a byproduct of the petroleum refineries and formerly was burned in the open air to get rid of it. Then a research genius of the petroleum industry struck on the happy thought of compressing the gas in steel bottles and using it for cooking and heating. Now, firms like the Rulane Gas Company, with headquarters in Charlotte, North Carolina, are serving more than six million customers across the country. Used for a host of services, including water heating, refrigeration, and a wide variety of industrial operations, 
Bottled gas is aiding in the decentralization of industries now being called for by the government in the face of possible attack. Started as a means of getting rid of a byproduct, the fast-growing bottled gas industry is here to stay. Our number one job today is to build up our military strength just as fast and just as efficiently as American ingenuity and know-how can accomplish the job. Our goal must be production, more and more production. And one of our great national assets is America's mighty industrial capacity, replaced, improved, and expanded during and following the last war. With all of us working together, Industry will continue to perform the production miracles it took to win World War II. Now we'd like you to meet a gentleman named Harlan Altman as he enters his workshop in the thriving community of Mora, Minnesota. There to put into application an idea. The idea that in America, a man is free to strike out on his own. Mora is in Minnesota's famed lake country, and while fishing through the ice one day, Harlan decided that ice fishermen needed something to help them combat certain problems like frozen lines and lines frayed on the edge of the ice. A carpenter, very handy with tools, Harlan went to work on the project in the shop in back of his home. There was no established ice stick manufacturing method, so like many men before him who have started out with the idea of filling a need, Harlan had to improvise as he went along. He worked out his own method of spacing the holes for bolts and of putting in the spike that would hold the stick upright. And as he proceeded, he kept improving on that original idea. One of Harlan's corner cutting inventions was a speedy method for turning eye bolts. And here's the finished product, which Harlan tried out himself and then began to place in sporting goods shops in his area. In the cold North Country, ice fishing is one of the most popular winter sports, and fishermen were quick to accept a device that promised to let them put their hands in their pockets once in a while. Here is the real test for any product, put to use in the hands of the customer. Somewhere under the ice is a two-foot northern pike that's going to prove that Harlan Altman had the right idea after all. One satisfied customer, 10 new orders for the Mora ice stick. Harlan Altman has always been alive to a man's opportunities in this country of ours. He made out pretty well as a carpenter, but he shared a dream common to most men of going into business for himself. Now, at the age of 56, Harlan Altman hangs out his shingle. Another dream come true under America's better way of life.